So I'm delighted to have Yan Chen here. Yan Chen is the Daniel Kahneman Professor of uh, Information from the School of Information at Michigan. Um, we, she has a very interesting background. Her uh, undergraduate degree is actually in English from Tsinghua, and then her uh, PhD is in social sciences from Caltech. That's, that's quite a mixture. Um, but Jan and Gary and I know each other from the School of Information. In fact, early in the School of Information, the classes were co-taught, which is a very good thing so that we could get to know each other because we came from so many different disciplines. And so Jan and I taught a course in experimental design. And from that, she learned to ask people what they're doing and I learned to make the incentives very clear. And then she and Gary taught a class together, and it had a funny title. Choice and Learning. Choice, Choice and Learning. And learning. It's about the, yeah. sort of the basics of cognitive psychology so that you could do design of things to be appropriate. Did you take that class, Matt? Yes, yeah. Matt was a <laughs> student at, at Michigan. So uh, join me in welcoming Jan to uh, this, our school. Thank you. Thank you so much for the gracious introduction, uh, Judy, and also for inviting me. So uh, I'm going to talk about essentially two papers, and they're on the same theme. And uh, so the first one is recommending teams promote given uh, evidence from online microfinance. Uh, so this is joint work with my former student, Roy Chen, who's at the National University of Singapore, and Wei, who's the current doctor student, Xiao Zhu, my colleague, in machine learning and Web Phillips from Kiva. So the motivation to this uh, research stream is about public goods provision, uh, which is when things there are goods which everybody enjoys and benefits from, but you know because they're not excludable, um, some people might have an incentive to free ride. Uh, so think about you know reading Wikipedia articles, you know, noticing a mistake, and not spending the time to correct um, and and to put put in the the right version. So that's what economists call the free rider problem. So within the field of economics, where uh, I was trained, uh, there is a large literature on incentive compatible mechanisms to reduce the free rider problem, or sometimes to solve the free rider problem. Um, but they basically require a central authority to enforce taxes and subsidies. So these are all about coming up with the right uh, tax, a very clever tax so that everybody has an incentive to contribute and to reveal their willingness to pay for that. And I started to work on online communities in around 2005. And soon you realize that these are communities with no central authority. So lots of the lessons that we learned from economic theory doesn't quite apply here. And uh, so they're characterized by two features. One is voluntary participation. The other part is voluntary contribution. So if you think about if someone free rides and we punish the person, well, the person can just leave. So it's hard to actually enforce punishment. So that leads us to look at alternative mechanisms, in particular non-pecuniary mechanisms. So we uh, looked at uh, identity, group identity, as a behavioral mechanism um, when monetary incentives are limited. So the social identity literature came from psychology and has a long tradition. The first time it was introduced in economics was by Akalov and Crenton. They have a series of of papers and, and book to aggressively apply this concept in the um, various economic settings. So I'm going to quickly go through the concept and, and look at identity as a behavioral mechanism to encourage given and, and contribution to public goods. So identity, social identity is defined as a person's sense of self derived from group membership. So it's typically multidimensional and dynamic. So you can think of your race, uh, your gender or occupation, your organization as part of uh, your identity. And it could evolve over time. Um, so the, uh, in psychology, the uh, social identity research started by understanding the question of why people from one group might discriminate against another people from another group. And it's, it's um, what they, what they have found is even very minimum categorizations. You, know, you randomly assign people to groups. 
uh, with no social interaction, and group membership is almost anonymous, in these settings, you can have what's called in-group favoritism and out-group discrimination. So people treat their own groups better than our groups, and they think that their own group members are uh, look more beautiful, they, <laughs> they allocate more tokens to them, and, and so on. So uh, we, we read this literature and derived from the idea that maybe we can use it in a more positive setting. Uh, and also, the parallel research in psychology have also looked at identity as motivation. So, um, so I'm going to look at identity and economic decision making, since the domain is going to be economic decision making on microfinance. So there has been a series of lab experiments which demonstrate that in the lab, um, people with strong identity will cooperate in prisoner's dilemma game. It increases cooperation. And when there are multiple equilibria that facilitates coordination, that they play the more efficient equilibrium. Um, it in in increases trust. So these are all lab studies. And there are lots of uh, social psychology lab experiments, which I'm not going to cite because they're huge. Um, in the field, uh, it would be interesting to know that whether the mechanisms that we synthesize from the lab would um, carry over to the field. So I found an older uh, psych publication by Eric Bornstein and Galili, uh, which looks at uh, fruit picking tasks. Uh, so this is in the orange grove. And they look at, you know, as a team, there is an incentive to free ride on the team's output. So people might not work so hard. But one of their mechanisms is to create teams and let the teams compete with each other. They find that when teams compete, um, it gives you the highest output, so the the the, uh, uh, the harvest. So so that's one of the early pieces of evidence that uh, the team competition could work in the lab. But because it's conducted in a uh, brick and mortar world, you actually can't follow people and see how they communicate. What was the mechanism that enabled that um, um, increased uh, uh, productivity? So. Uh, what we're going to do is to use the online community setting, and one of the advantages is that all the communications are recorded in the forum, so we can actually look into the mechanisms for uh, increased cooperation. So the setting, the uh, field setting that we use is kiva.org. Uh, how many people know about Kiva? Have heard of? Okay, about, about half. So I'm going to quickly introduce it. So Kiva is the first peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending platform. So uh, in microfinance, there, there has been a, a problem in the uh, access to credit, especially in developing countries, which is uh, poor people, small entrepreneurs, typically are excluded from the formal banking sector because they do not have collateral or they don't have credit history. Therefore, they cannot borrow. And so uh, microfinance was a mechanism to uh, try to mitigate that problem. So, uh, which is, you know, essentially enables small loans, you know, small entrepreneurs to borrow a, uh, a loan that's relatively a low amount. And what Kiva enabled is that every ordinary people, ordinary citizens can become banks. We can become um, lenders. So anybody can register on Kiva and make a loan to one of the entrepreneurs featured on the site. They typically have 2,000 or so entrepreneurs from developing countries. And uh, you can make a loan as small as $25 or up. And these loans are zero interest for the lenders, So, which means that you actually, it's not a for-profit motive. It's, you don't park your money there to earn profit, uh, to earn interest. So uh, in a separate paper, we look at people's stated motivation. They're primarily for pro-social reasons. They're there because they want to help people. Um, and so Kiva has been fairly successful. So this is actually the statistics is not exactly quite up to date. So they have made more than $500 million in loans. And uh, they have 1.5 borrowers from 70, 73 countries and 2 million lenders across 208 countries. So uh, the classic Kiva model is uh, to collaborate with the local microfinance uh, institutions. So the borrowers are pre-selected. So which means that the repayment rate is actually very high. It's about 
more recently, they created a new mechanism, which uh, is called Kiva Zip. So these are direct loans. So it's transferred from my PayPal account to the borrower's PayPal account. So it's truly zero interest. But because of this elimination, the repayment rate is also a little bit lower. It's about 90% uh, for Zip loans. Um, so when Kiva was first created, and there were a lot of buzz around it. Um, and then people forgot about Kiva. <laughs> they make one loan, and then they just never come back again. So at some point, Kiva was sitting on millions of dollars of repaid loans. And all the lenders need to do is to come back and click, you know, pick someone else and reloan it. So what you see here is, uh, is this problem, which I'll just describe uh, in words, that the uh, few lenders make many loans. So you have some very active lenders up here. And many lenders make a few loans. And a third of the lenders actually have never made a loan. It's not clear why they're there, but they've, they've never made a loan. So Kiva's problem is to increase lender participation. And this is not a new problem for online communities. You, know, you, you have lots of peripheral uh, users. How do you get them to contribute and to engage? Um, so Kiva's uh, mechanism is to create lending teams. So I'm tying back to the public goods problem. Right? What happens when people don't contribute? So they created lending teams, and Prima Shah, who's the uh, Kiva um, CEO, said that the idea is to make Kiva as fun and compelling as possible. And the atheist team captain said that the whole idea of teams implies that there should be competition, so that you know teams would create, you know, be created and compete with each other. So the lending teams mechanism after creation, there are about thirty-seven thousand lending teams now, but there are lots of heterogeneity. So we're trying to look at you know, this naturally occurring mechanism and evaluate how well it works. Um, but our evaluation will be through an experiment. So I'm going to first uh, examine a team and argue that this is exactly what we in the lab create as social groups. So this is Team Canada's uh, lending page. They have a common statement. They say, we loan because, and every team has a statement about why they loan money. So little means so much, and because we're so fortunate, and so on. So they have a common theme, and they also create intergroup competition through the uh, Kiva leaderboard. And they enable communication within the teams through the, their dedicated forums. Uh, we know that in the lab, all of these mechanisms help um, create group identity. So I'm going to take a snapshot of the Kiva leaderboard, the team leaderboard, and zoom in on the top two teams. So I don't know whether you can see this, but the top team, which is also the largest team on Kiva, is the Kiva Atheists. And the second place, all time, second largest team is the Kiva Christians. So these are <laughs> religious teams, uh, religion based, or lack thereof. Um, and there are also, you know, country, organization, uh, university teams. So lots of these are identity-based. So we're basically asking two questions. One is whether joining a team increases lending. So we're going to do that through a very simple theoretical model. And we use the first field experiment to evaluate uh, whether joining a team increases lending. And the second question is to explore, the second part is to explore the underlying mechanisms for why uh, team membership increases uh, giving, what makes it effective. So the theoretical framework is built on the sequential contributions to public goods literature, but by incorporating some of the features of online microfinance. So I'm going to very quickly go through the model. It's a very simple model, but it generates some predictions for what we should be looking for in the data. Um, so we assume that everybody has a search cost, and um, that there is also a match quality between a member and a team, a lender and a team. Um, they also have opportunity cost of making a loan, and um, and that one borrower is a, is a lender's best match. So after these assumptions, we can write down a utility model when a lender doesn't belong to a team. And we're just going to make a comparison between what happens if someone doesn't belong to a team versus when he or she belongs to a team. And we solve the model through backward induction. 
um, that can lead us to characterize the, the cost, the search cost threshold, where you either search or, or not. And um, so let me just go through the, uh, the proposition directly. So the first proposition is about the effect of team competition. And we say that if a lender cares sufficiently about the total amount of loans provided by her team, which is if they're ranking, your, rank, your team ranking is based on the total amount of loans, um, then you are more likely to search, to incur the search costs, and to make more loans than the lender who doesn't belong to any team. So this is through a re reduced form model. And the second proposition is looking at the coordination channel, which is what we observe on the Kiva uh, forum is that people often refer loans to each other. So if we're all in the, uh, let's see, UC Irvine team, and we might share some uh, common interests about who, who we would like to help. So if my teammate, let's say, if Judy um, found a, a, a borrower which she has made a loan to, she could post and say, I've just made a loan to so-and-so. This is why the, 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 the borrower wants to, make, to, to get this loan. Please join me, and here's the URL. So if Judy did the work, then that means you know I trust her judgment that I can just pitch in. I can click on the URL instead of doing my own search. So um, a lender who belongs to a lending team where members recommend loans to each other will be more likely to make loans than someone who doesn't belong to any team. So that's the, the second mechanism, which is through coordination. Um, so okay. So uh, we're going to evaluate, you know essentially these per directional predictions. So our data, first, the f our first data source is from their public API, and then we also got two waves of data done uh, for our experimental analysis. So this is whether, this is a, a raw plot of whether joining a team increases lending. What you see here is um, by month, you know, May 2007, this is each month. And the, the black diamonds, are you know, the average number of loans of those lenders who don't belong to any teams. And the green triangles are those who join the team at some point. Okay. So if you look at here, and you know, this, is, this vertical line is August 2008. That's when Kiva created its teams. Kiva said, let there be teams. And so every, anybody can create a team, and anybody can join a team. So if you look at here, this gap, you would say, well, you know, the green triangles, those who belong to a team, actually are more active. They make more loans uh, on a monthly average basis than those who don't belong to any teams. The problem with that story is what happens before this. Okay. Before teams were even created, the green triangles were more active than um, the black diamonds. So those who belong to a team actually were more active before teams even exist. So in uh, statistics, this is uh, a selection problem. Okay, so we have to deal with that. So the selection problem says that you know, part of the effect of teams, maybe all of them, is because you sort of round up the people who are more active and, and get them to work together. Okay, so, <coughs> so it's important to actually tease out the two effects. And the way we tease that out is through a field experiment, is through randomization. So the hypothesis for the first experiment is that lenders would be more likely to join teams if we make good recommendations. So we're going to recommend teams to lenders and, and watch what happens. You know, how likely they are to join teams, and if they join teams, how active they are compared to those in the control group uh, who, who did not join teams. So the recommendations, so we use recommender algorithms. So it's either based on homophily, which is you know location similarity, you live in the same area, or loan history similarity. So if you guys have all made loans, to, made a lot of loans to Kenya, um, I, by, I am a standalone um, lender. I have also made a lot of loans to, to to Kenya to entrepreneurs in Kenya. Then the algorithm would recognize me and say, well, how about joining this team? you have similar long history. So that's the, uh, the second, long history similarity. And the third one is based on status, that people tend to join you know, high status teams. 
And um, so we just recommended the three most popular teams uh, on Kiva at the time on the leaderboard, and which are the atheists and the Christians and guys holding fish. Actually, the third, <laughs> the third ranked team was actually HP um, but at the time, but Kiva asked us not to recommend it because it was meant to be for HP employees. Mm -hmm. uh, guys Holding Fish was the, you know, the next up. It was a team that make loans to um, fishermen and people in the fishing industry. Um, and, and then we basically observed, we, we hypothesized that they will lend more if they join teams. So the field experiment was conducted about almost two years ago. And the sample selection criteria is that the lenders have, this is the only criteria that we impose, which is they haven't joined any teams. That's about 82% of the Cuba lenders. Um, the others were imposed by Cuba, that they have to have made at least two loans in the past six, two, six months. But they have location information and allow marketing emails. So this is the box you check when you sign up. Um, and after imposing this, this gives us about 70,000 lenders. Um, that's, that's our sample. And so our experiment design is a, a three by two factorial design. So the first dimension varies on the algorithm. You know, you're make, giving a recommendation based on location similarity or long history similarity or your status on, you know, on the leaderboard. And the other dimension varies whether we explain it or not. And this is of interest for Chiao Juwen, the computer scientist on the team, which is, you know, do you want to, how, how much does explanation uh, increase the likelihood of, uh, of action? And we have a control condition and a placebo condition. So why do we have these? So the control condition is when you don't, con you leave them alone. You don't contact these, we didn't contact these lenders at all. And the placebo condition basically says, you know, we send out an email and we say, do you know that there are lending teams on Kiva? And here's the URL. So that controls for contact. So from here to here, you get the effect of contact. And from here to any of the treatments, you get the actual recommendation effect. So this is the team, the Teams Exist email. So it says, hi, Wei, since you're such a an awesome Kiva lender, we wanted to let you know about a fun feature of the Kiva experience, Kiva lending teams. And if you click on this, it will take you to the teams page. And it explains what teams are and ends with check out some of the thousands of lending teams to find the right ones for you. Again, if you click on this, it will take you to the teams page. So this email was in every treatment. So the, the, the treatment part is in between, inserted in between. And so this is an example of you know, what happens when you get a treatment. Um, you start with the same opening and the same ending, but it says based on your past lending, people who have made similar loans enjoy being part of these teams. So these are the three teams okay, that we recommended based on long history similarity. So these are some of the languages that we use. Other lenders who live near you, so this is the location similarity and long history similarity, and some of the most popular teams are. And here are the, you know, a few teams that you might want to check out. So we'll run the same algorithm, but without explaining it. So here's uh, this, the numbers, uh, which is, here are the eight experimental conditions, each receive, except for the control, each receive, uh, you know, 8,000 uh, vendors to it. So. Uh, about a third of them open their email, <laughs> um, which is common. So this is, if you will, this is our intent to treat sample, and this is our actually treating sample. And these are people who join the team, and this is people who join the recommended team. So if we look at the figure, it will be actually, oh, not, not yet. So these are the, the difference. So the median of the public lenders have made zero loans, okay? And the, our sample in the 70,000 has made, so the median has made 23 loans. And um, those in our analysis whose email didn't bounce is 22, and those who joined teams, so we'll have 600 people who joined teams. They have made 20 loans. So these three are not very different, but they're very different from the population. Uh, so this is the proportion joining a team. Here's treating 
all lenders, including those who didn't open their email. And this is more informative. These are lenders who opened the email. So if you look at the bar that has the highest proportion, which is about 3%, those are, this is location with explanation. So this seems to have um, the highest proportion of take up rate. And this is actually similar to, uh, if you look at charitable giving field experiments, usually if you contact people about one to two to three percent, some, somewhere in that range actually makes a donation. So it's in line with what we observe in other experiments. So now we're going to uh, take a look at, um, um, at the uh, regression analysis. So here, basically, it's important to have a no contact control because some, some people find teams themselves and join some. Team exists also, you know, without recommendation, people also join teams. So here's the uh, uh, probate regression, which looks at, you know, basically every condition did better than the control. So the omitted category is the control, okay? So this looks at the likelihood of joining teams only as a function of the experimental treatment. But then if you look at um, the users who opened their emails and compare them, this is those who opened their emails, and compare them to the Teams Exist condition, uh, two did better, location with explanation and long history with explanation did significantly better than uh, the placebo condition. Um, so this is just a summary. So location with explanation has the largest effect. And um, it also survives if you do multiple hypothesis testing correction, it still survives. Okay, this, this effect is still significant, whereas the history with explanation becomes insignificant if you correct for multiple hypothesis testing. Um, so that's the first one, which is you know, what is the likelihood that they join teams once they're contacted, uh, once they, you recommend a team to them. And the second one, which is, um, which is sort of the, the important part, is to look at the effect of team membership on lending amount. That's the gap that we're trying to explain. So what this one uh, displays is, is the uh, difference in differences regression of the average daily lending amount. And this is the two-stage least squares regression, uh, instrumental variable regression. So, the one e econometric problem that we're trying to solve is the selection problem, which is people who are more active are more likely to join teams. And so one technique that's being used uh, to uh, correct for, to address the endogeneity problem is, the, is, is called an instrumental variable approach. So you select an instrument that's correlated with joining teams with the first stage, but not with the second stage. So that instrument by itself can now cause more lending. So here we use email, whether you received an email from the experimenter or not, as an instrument. So yes, if people receive email, an email from us, they're more likely to join a team. So the only experimental condition um, that did not receive an email is the control. Right? So they're more likely to join a team. So our first stage is strong, um, which means that we have a strong instrument. And the second stage says that given you join a team, um, what's the effect of teams compared to those who don't join teams? And um, the second stage basically requires what's called an exclusion restriction, which says that receiving an email by itself does not lead to more lending. And uh, we can justify that actually using the second experiment, which I'm going to talk about. Um, so the one day effect, you use the you know, the day after receiving the email minus the day before, so that's the first difference. And you use that difference, then compare it again, subtracting the difference from the control condition. So that's the difference in differences. So the, the effect is about $300 in the first day, okay? What about seven days? So it's about $56 per day, roughly $400 per week. And then it falls off. So we have data 50 days after the intervention. And, uh, but after seven days, there's no effect anymore. So there are probably two reasons for this. One is email is a short-term intervention, which is you receive an email if you don't check it or you don't take an action for seven days, you're probably going to forget about it. 
The second one is people, lots of lenders that, you know, Kiva did some interviews and we also talked to some lenders. They have this model of a fixed amount. So, you know, people would say, oh, I put $800 in Kiva and I don't take it out. So I just basically wait till it comes back and the loan repayment is about 12 months. So once they loan it out, the joint teams, you know, they're excited, they loan it out, and then they wait um, till the loan's repaid. So which means that we can't actually observe the long-term effect, but in the short term, it's quite high. And so this is a visualization, a simple one, of how uh, the effect compares to the median lender's lifetime contribution. So the median lender's lifetime contribution on Kiva is $25, $25. And this is the one week effect, which is $400. So it's about 15 times. Okay. It's, it's, um, it's quite large. Um, so to summarize the first one, uh, we went out to see whether you know, teams have any effect controlling for selection. And we find that, yes, if you make recommendations based on location with explanation, it has the largest effect. And so homophily seems to do better than status. We also did the comparison of various models. Homophily does better. Um, so location with explanation, I was actually quite surprised by it because um, these are virtual teams. <laughs> they don't need to be co-located to do the lending. But somehow they, um, you know, they're still attracted by the location-based teams. Um, and the effect is quite large. It's about, you know, $300 in one day and $400 in, in seven days. So it basically supports, it's one field experiment that supports, you know, team membership and team competition as an effective behavioral mechanism for public goods provision. Um, and the next part, we're going to look at why. You know, why um, does joining a team lead to more lending? So um, part of this is by looking at the 30,000 teams, and there are quite a bit of heterogeneity among them. About 43% of the teams were active, um, if you look at what happened in the previous year. So what's nice about uh, online teams is that all the communication happens in the forum, so we can actually look at forum manipulations and look at what uh, increases lending. So we explore the coordination aspect and, and the competition aspect. Uh, look at the uh, team position of the leaderboard. So chronologically, actually, this is the first experiment, <laughs> and the other one's the second. For this experiment, we actually didn't. We went ahead and did it ourselves without going through Kiva. And the second experiment, they liked the first one, so they helped us uh, send out 70,000 emails in the second one. So we randomly selected 2,000 open teams. So open teams are those anybody can join. Uh, for closed teams, you have to go through the team captain's permission. Um, and also, about 70% of the teams are open. We drop teams with fewer than five members, and those tend to be family and friends. Um, and you'll see why, because we're going to actually join the teams. Um, and that gives us 550 teams. In the end, between our randomization and the actual experiment, 14 teams were closed, became closed teams. And so we actually only had 536 teams. And then we randomly assigned these teams to four treatments and one control condition. The average team size at the time was about 47 members. And uh, so the total number of lenders in our experiment here is 22,000. So this is our factorial design, looking at the competition dimension and the coordination dimension. So in the case, so goal basically says, you know, someone, one of our research assistants join a team and they set a goal for the team. They say, you know, our research assistant makes a real $25 loan, credit it to the team, so it counts for the team leaderboard. And he says, um, you know, if each of us make a $25 loan, we'll improve our ranking. Uh, so this is our, our goal condition. And for the no goal, no link condition, the new member essentially joins the team, makes a loan, credited to the team, uh, come in and just introduce himself. Say, hi, you know, I am Paul, I'm new to the team. 
I just made a loan credit to the team. And with the link, <coughs> he says, I made a loan to so-and-so, and here's the URL. So this reduces the search cost. Then if you have both conditions, both the goal and the link, you have everything. You have the new member introduction, the goal, and the link. And the control condition is our member joined the team and makes a loan credited to the team by saying nothing. So this just controls for the new team, the new member, and the new loan effects. So this, this experiment has a minor deception part. <laughs> Here I'm going to explain how it works. So because we didn't go through Kiva, we actually uh, asked our research assistants to join teams. So they, uh, and we created new lender identities for them. We created 50 new identities. And the names are taken from the top 25 most popular um, male and female first names and the 50 most popular last names based on the 1990 census. Um, we also take the location is the capital city of each state. And uh, we didn't provide occupation information or upload pictures, and then we randomly match the names with the locations. Um, so each lender joins 11 teams, and they make a loan and assign to each team. So the, the loans are all real. So for this experiment, we spent about $13,000 making loans. And, and the protocol was approved by Kiva. So basically, I went to Kiva to make a presentation, and I said, I don't want to shock you, but we're going to do an experiment. And this is how we're going to run it. And they said, OK. <laughs> and they said, you know, we would like to get an Excel file of your um, artificial lenders. So, so that's what we did. So I've said this. So let me, let me go through an example. So this is the case. This is the both, you know, when the lender has stated both the goal and the link, and it's a real message. So it says, hi, I'm Paul, and I'm new to the team. I just credited my first loan to the team. So this is the introduction. It's in every treatment. And then Paul says, I loan to Sandra from Columbia. And these two sentences about what Sandra wants um, is taken from the Kiva description. And here's the URL to her request. So this is the coordination piece, you know. And, and then here's the goal setting. If each of us make a $25 loan in the next month, we'll improve our rank. So that's the competition piece. It's very neutral that, you know, that piece can be inserted into any team. Then this is what followed on the forum. Um, so it's a cascade of messages. So it says, welcome Paul, I add a $25 more to Sandra as well. Good call, and so on, so on, so on. So the team members all pitched in for this loan. Okay. Um, where's the deception part? Well, the deception part is none of our research assistant's name is Paul. <laughs> and, but the loan's real. They can click on Sandra's page and find that Paul is listed as one of the, um, one of the lenders. Um, they can also click on Paul's page and find out how many loans he's made. So this is the combined treatment effect. What you see here, here's our intervention message. This is what an email went out, was posted on the forum. And the green dotted line, the, the, gray, the gray dotted line is the control, where our lender joined the team but said nothing. Okay, made the loan, joined the team, said nothing. And the blue line is the, uh, the treatment. It's the combined treatment uh, for inactive teams. So it turns out that for active teams, there's not much of an effect. Uh, so we're, we're going to go through how, how this works. So we define inactive teams as those who haven't said anything in six months on the forum, in the, in the 12 months before our experiment. And the active ones are those who said something. Okay. And so, by the way, the activities on the forum also correlate with lending, with how active the team was. The team so again, this is the difference in differences regression for the one day, four day, seven day, 10 day, and 30 day window. So what you see as significant is the goal setting. Right? Goal with no link has an effect almost 30 days afterwards. These are from the inactive teams. And with both goal and link, it also has a significant effect. Turns out that the um, coordination message did not have an effect. Um, and the reason for that is because our borrowers are randomly selected. 
And the only criteria is that they have at least $1,000 left so that if people want to pitch in, they can pitch in. Um, it didn't have an effect because, I think, partly because it's not necessarily a good match. People form teams so that they can select um, the congruent, you know, appropriate borrowers. So in one example, the worst example is when our lender joined, uh, joined a team and suggested a borrower from uh, Kazakhstan. And the team said, oh, by the way, you know, thank you for making the loan. Then, you know, welcome. And they said, by the way, our team specialized in loans to Tajikistan. <laughs> so it was a complete mismatch. But that's the downside of, of random assignment. <laughs> So basically, the effect is um, it's, it's 0.03 more loans per day in the four-day window. And if you aggregate this, this is what you see. Um, so the goal-setting treatments are, are effective. And each lender makes about 0.24 more loans in a 30-day window, which is, which is, if you adjust for team size, about four more loans per inactive team per month which is pretty good because these are teams who haven't done anything in 12 for 12 months. And from, from Kiva's perspective, um, they should not worry about the active teams. They should worry about the inactive teams. I'm going to give um, one explanation about why the effect, you only see the effect in inactive teams. Um, so Kiva's mechanism for making um, the forum messages heard is it aggregates everything in one day that was said on the forum in 24 hours and send one email to the team members in the morning, the next morning. So you see what happened you know, in one email message that day. So for the inactive teams, they haven't received an email for 12 months. And here, there's an email from Kiva. For the active teams, they're talking to each other all the time. So our message is just one in this aggregate email message. Um, I think it was just, it was just buried. Um, so here's what happened. Uh, you know, the other part is our goal is actually very mild. We say if each of us make a $25 loan and pull out rank, which is blend and neutral. And this is what happens in the actual forum when they talk about goals. Okay? So this is one example from the Nerd Fighters team. So this guy says, guys, we've beaten both the Trotec Foundation and the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster in the past weeks. We're now number 17 on the most lended list. Next up, India, which is Team India. It's very specific about whom we just surpassed, what the next team up is. So it's very team specific. Whereas ours, we want to make it neutral, but it should really be taken as the lower bound of the effect. So it's, um, So uh, I'm, I think, pretty much done with the, uh, the, the content. So let me just summarize this, uh, this work, which is we want to evaluate using uh, group membership or teams as a behavior mechanism for public goods contribution. And so we do this through um, a field experiment that evaluate the effect of team membership on lending and lending amount, and then we, do, we did another experiment on the actual mechanisms. You know, what is it? We, which part um, makes a difference? So the first part, you know, does it work? Does joining a team increase lending? The answer is yes, and the effect size is about you know, $400 a, month, uh, 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 a week in the first week. And um, so there is a, a short-term effect in this context. And the field experiment uses the recommender systems. Um, so it's, uh, it seems easy, you know, 70,000 emails in one day. But before that, uh, <coughs> Wei was the first author. <coughs> Chiao Zhu actually ran a cargo competition in his uh, data mining class. And Wei, who's the first author of this paper, was the winner. <coughs> so his algorithm was location-based. And so we pitched his winning algorithm based on offline data to Kiva. Uh, Kiva said, okay, let's give it a try. And ex ante, we all thought that the long history similarity would outperform the location, but it didn't. So Wei's algorithm continued to be the winner. Um, 
So the reason why is because on the forums, what does team do? So this goes back to the organization theory. You know, fundamentally, what does an organization do? An organization reduces transaction costs. And so it has that flavor because they share borrow URLs and um, it facilitates coordination. So it reduces search costs. The other one is that the competition side um, you know, is accomplished through goal setting. So you see that in naturally occurring messages as well. And our experiments show that the competition aspect is more significant. Um, but through this, you know, giving all the caveats <coughs> about, about running an experiment. Um, so this is through uh, manipulating forum <coughs> messages. Um, so that's it. This is, this is the, the summary of the, of the two experiments. And so where this research is going, you know, is to look at, you know, uh, we want to actually analyze the network structure. So not all team members are equal. So instead of having a research assistant joining a team as a new member, a new member's recommendation might not be as effective as the core group member. So we'll, we crunch the data and look at who's the most followed person in each team. And we're going to give that person a gift card. And so the person can make a loan and post um, on the on the leader. Yeah. Okay. So great. Okay. We have time for questions, and we will pass the mic so that you can uh, hear each other. Great. So a location affected uh, people joining teams. Did, does it affect the behavior of teams? That is, if you're more likely to give loans to some, some either uh, places in your location or you have a kind of like a pet location that you tend to support? Mm -hmm. Good question. We did not look at that, partly because um, sometimes, um, so let's, let's first take the first part, which is your location. Um, so Kiva was set up to, to help entrepreneurs in developing countries, uh, but during the financial crisis, it started a it started a Kiva team uh, Kiva City initiative in North America. So the first Kiva City was Detroit. <laughs> now surprisingly, mm -hmm. and so you know, all the major cities have uh, are Kiva cities now. Um, so these loans there are fewer, so we don't quite have the power to do the analysis. But we know as a fact that any time, let's say a Detroit entrepreneur requests a loan, it was fulfilled within 24 hours. It's very quick. Um, but we don't quite have the statistical power to compare because the, the, the major issue with the Kiva City loans is that the approval process is very long. So in the first year, they only approved nine loans out of Detroit. Um, so the numbers are small, but we know uh, as a fact that it was, they were fulfilled very quickly. And these are Detroit and mission-based teams fulfilling Detroit loans. Um, so these teams are primarily lending to entrepreneurs in developing countries. Um, we have to check and see whether there are consistency in, in the new loans compared to the past history. So, um, so teams do have congruency in their loans. So, uh, one example was that someone from the atheist team actually developed an app that you can use to screen the microfinance, local microfinance institutions and see if they're religion based. So if you want to um, make only loans to those who are not affiliated with a religious you know, local microfinance institution, you can just run the app and do, it will, it will do the screening for you. But then there are arguments actually among the members of the atheist team whether, you know, whether this is the right thing to do. So. <laughs> I have a question, then I'll pass it on to you. Um, what's Kiva's business model? Where's their money coming from? Um, so they're a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, when you make loans, um, they'll ask you to make a small donation. Uh, so there are two sources. One is they'll ask you to make you know, a $3 donation. And I suspect that most people do. I, I, I do. And <laughs> um, the other one is, um, they get loan repayment throughout the year 
but they collect the interest and they redispense the loans to the lender account in the middle of the month. Mm -hmm. So they get some interest, yeah. yeah. And the third component is uh, lots of tech companies uh, support Kiva in kind. So for instance, Kiva doesn't have a finance department because PayPal handles all the Kiva transactions. Uh, Kiva doesn't have a server farm because IBM do, do donate their servers. And so they have a very lean organization. I would just say that. Um, the theory part, you went very fast. Can you briefly explain yeah, what is a general okay. framework for Yeah, yeah. So let me, uh, I, I, what happened? Okay. That's right. Oh, good. So let me go through this theory part um, a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail. So the theory part is in um, the second experiment. And the first that you explained. Yeah. The first I explained, well, because um, it fits into the second experiment because, well, actually the second experiment was done before the first experiment. <laughs> but the talk, the logic of the talk went better that way. Um, so let me quickly explain how this works um, and how we generate the uh, propositions. So the everybody has a quasi-linear utility function. This is, from psychologists, this is your motivation. This is the economist's motivation component. So I care about my private disposable income. I care about the public goods that deserving entrepreneurs get funded. That's the capital G. And I care about the match. If I want to loan to a fisherman, I want to actually have a fisherman. <coughs> so I derive utility or motivation from the right type of match and from you know, the total amount contributed to public goods. I have some initial endowments. I subtract my loan, how much I loaned out. This is what remains. And there's also some search costs. I have to spend time to search through the 2,000 entrepreneurs. And then once I find someone, I, I make a loan. So the way I solve this is through backward induction. I say, suppose I find someone. What's my optimal amount that I should loan? So I maximize my utility so, uh, and by choosing the amount I loan. And this, this, if you make the right assumptions on the functional form, you get an interior solution. So this is a maximization problem. And um, so you can solve for the optimal loan amount once you find someone. And, um, and then in the first stage, I can figure out, you know, given that this is my optimal loan amount, what is the search cost threshold? You know, if the search cost is below a certain threshold, if it's not too time consuming, I would search and then make a loan. And the search cost is um, related to the match quality and how much I get, how much pleasure I get out of the public good if I contribute, and subtracting, what if I contribute? Everybody else contribute, but I free ride. So this is the difference of, the difference I make to my utility, minus the opportunity cost of capital. So, yeah. so other people only affect the search cost part, but the other parts in your utility, there is no other individual. Yeah, so the capital G is the sum of the individual Gs. So this is the total, oh, so let's say, have all the, individual the individual contributions. Okay. So that's where, this is the public goods component. So I didn't, I didn't write down, this. it was in the previous slide, yeah. So I make, mm -hmm. I make a loan to a borrower who requested 2,000. I was, I'm only able to make $25. So the total amount of public goods to this particular borrower is the sum of everyone who contribute to him. Okay. Yeah. So that's when I stand alone. I have to do the search. I have to do everything myself. And what happens if there, I'm part of a team? If I'm a part of a team, we also make an, an assumption that we have similar taste within the team. Then I care about my team's contribution. And da, 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 this is the same. And this is the extra kick. Um, which is, I care about my team's ranking, which is a function of the total amount that my team contributed. 
it's not a full model. Um, I think Don's probably frowning. No, no, I'm just looking at it. It has, a large, be, it has yeah. a large number of possible interpretations rather than right. one you have because right. of the form which you have there. Yeah. And the, and the total amount, my, my team's ranking depends on my team's contribution, but also every other team's contribution, which I ignored here. So uh, essentially, this is how, how strongly you feel your identity, how much you identify with the team, how, how strongly you feel about the team. And because it increases the benefits part, it's going to, if gamma is high enough, you're going to be more willing to search and more willing to, uh, to look. Yeah. Yeah, because I can interpret the way you have it there, yeah. it could be rather than the ranking, it could also be the benefit I get by being on the team. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, the way yeah. you have it written down there. Right, right. I it mean, there's a large, large number of things that uh, yes. uh, are very different than what you have, yeah. which could be possibly a, but it's me, it's what I get from being on a team, period. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I, I enjoy being part of a team that contribute a lot. So I enjoy being part of an active team more than a dead team. And that can also be one of, that's also one of the implications. Yeah, Gary. Do you get any teams forming collections of teams? Like uh, we yeah we haven't seen it, but um, the first time I actually made a presentation at Kiva, the first question was actually the optimal team size. <laughs> they realized that the atheist team and the Christian teams are too big, so so you know they said, what's the optimal team size? Should we break them up or <laughs> do we do something? You know, create small teams within the the atheist team or the Christian team. I noticed you had an atheist team, you had a religious team, and then you had one that gave multiplying the fish. Yes. <laughs> well, there are 30,000 teams. And so the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor has about eight teams. You know, the different schools has its own team. There's a University of Michigan alumni team. There's a team in Arbor. So, uh, well, maybe it's a yeah. try oligarchy because though there, there are like several monopolies, but they're not real monopolists. So maybe you can try oligarchy kind of like component into your model. Into the model with, with oligopoly, yeah, with I'm sorry, not oligarchy. No oligopoly. So that you have several monopolists but they're not really dominant the entire lending market. They yeah, you have yeah. several major So more competition. Lenders. Yeah, yeah. I mean intuitively you want um, partition the team such that they're about equal size. And so the, the, on the margin, a little bit of effort will make a, a bigger difference in ranking. Um, yeah. Absolutely fascinating. I wanted to, before I say anything else, thank oh, you. thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. But it raises so many interesting questions about group dynamics in general. Right. In particular, when you're ranking these groups, you're ranking them regardless of size as opposed to ranking them, you know, you're in the little leagues, you're in the big leagues, yes. whatever, and yeah. so forth. Also, have they done any study of the internal dynamics of the team? So you've got 38 people in the team. Are there five people that are carrying the whole thing, or, you know? Yeah, no. I mean, so we actually have a lot of data. We only yeah. scratch the surface. Um, they actually do have multiple leaderboards, except that you have to dig very deep. To, to find out, you know, so the thing is, if you're not, you know, if you look at all time rankings, there's no way to beat the atheists because they've been around for a long time. They're the largest team. Um, but they now have, you know, the ranking leaderboard this month, the leaderboard past month, that enables smaller teams to come up. I, I, I guess I find myself fascinated by what might this say about the dynamics, and I'm hesitant to say this. In the, president to, in the presence of the Olsons about the internal dynamics of the group and who carries the load. And yeah, that yeah. seems to me to be such a fertile area, yeah. possibly even yeah. extrapolable yeah. to other enterprises. So Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we more could, power yeah. to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely for the, on the let future to do list. Let me yeah. ask just one last question before yeah. we go to our reception. Yeah. What advice do you have for researchers about working with an organization like this and having an IRB? Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, we're very fortunate in the sense that, you know, the IRB person in charge of the SI project is completely reasonable and efficient. <laughs> and so if we, if we call her up and say, we really 
don't want people to sign an informed consent, and this is why? She'll say, okay. <laughs> you can get a waiver, so, yeah. But what, how did you um, approach Kiva? Kiva, yeah. Um, so our first paper, which is about motivations, is only using the API data. We downloaded the API, we did the analysis, and published the paper in Wisdom. And um, the paper, so they went to a recommender system conference. One of our doctoral students was also there. They started to talk, and our doctoral student, Daniel, Joe said, we have a group who study you. <laughs> so so they, uh, he made the introduction. And we give them our paper. And I was going to the Bay Area. I said, can I just come and give a seminar? And they said, yeah. So and very soon, I think, they realized that they like our analysis. And so this sort of step by step. Yeah. Well, let's thank Jan again. Yeah. Thank you.